Shilpa, you can start. <laughs> So very good morning and warm welcome to online anesthesia. This is the uh, 27th session of this online anesthesia post-digit teaching program on Zoom platform sponsored by Acrola and hosted by A1 Logics and simultaneously aired by Anesthesia TV. Today we are hosting critical care series 50 week. Today topics are, first topic is my scoring system in ICU by Dr. K. Subaradi, followed by ventilator graphics by Dr. Sandra Seger. Today's session is coordinated by Dr. Rajesh J. Prakas. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, sir, and good morning, Umandal. I'm very happy to introduce one of my very good friends from uh, postgraduate days uh, for this session, uh, Dr. K. Subha Reddy. Uh, I know him for the past 18 years. He's a young dynamic anesthesiologist. Right from the beginning, he was so much interested in teaching and also in critical care. Right now, he is chairman of uh, ISCCM uh, Hyderabad and he is senior consultant, head department of critical care, Apollo Health City, Hyderabad. And he is also medical director for Apopas Rehabilitation Center with enormous interest over uh, teaching neurocritical care, ECMO. And he is a faculty for uh, DNB critical care. And he is also examiner in for uh, ISCCM uh, exam. Uh, we welcome you, Subha, to deliver a lecture here on the topic uh, scoring system in ICU. Over to you, Subha. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for that uh, nice introduction. And uh, it's really my honor to be uh, on this platform uh, talking about uh, scoring systems in intensive care unit, which is a very, very important topic. So the scoring systems are uh, required. Uh, I'm sorry. So scoring systems are required uh, everywhere. We have, we know in anesthesia, we have some scoring systems. In intensive care, we have scoring systems. And then you take rehab, there are some scoring systems. The physiatrist and the physiotherapist, they follow some scoring system. Basically, all these scoring systems are to understand whether the patient, how is the patient doing? How, what is the, uh, what is your prediction? What is the prediction of mortality? And how is the outcome? And to compare, uh, to compare different intensive care unit, to compare with other intensive care unit, how your intensive care is doing. Uh, like you need some parameters to say that your intensive care unit better or it has to improve when compared to other in ICUs. And when you're doing some research, so you have to use some tools to identify, to see whether the patient is getting better, what is the predicted mortality and what is the observed mortality. All these things we need to know when, uh, so we need uh, some good scoring systems in intensive care unit. So, uh, and other than this, it is a very, very important question for anesthesia in anesthesia exams and very important for even critical care exams, different scoring systems. So it is difficult to know all the scoring systems in intensive care unit in 45 minutes. I'll be giving outline of all the scoring systems in intensive care unit. Other than this, it is a now uh, NABH requirement and JCI requirement to calculate standardized mortality rate. So it's not enough if you monitor the crude mortality rate. So you have to monitor the standardized mortality rate. You get standardized mortality rate if you like you have the observed mortality rate and then you have to predict the mortality. You should have the predicted mortality rate and then you have to calculate the standardized mortality rate. And this is done by uh, the ICU consultants and then the quality team and the medical records team. Medical records team will be monitoring the observed mortality and the quality team will be taking the Apache scores from the ICU and then they will have predicted mortality and then they calculate standardized mortality rate. It is, SMR is a very, very important parameter for all the intensive care unit. So next 45 minutes to 50 minutes, I'll be talking about scoring systems in intensive care unit. And if you have any doubt, uh, you can put it, you can ask your questions in the chat box. We'll discuss at the end of the session and it is slightly uh, sometimes you think it is too much theory but 
uh, you can uh, stop me if you want and if you want if you want to ask any question in between so if you look at the scoring systems in intensive care unit we have general scoring systems in intensive care unit uh, for a sepsis patient or for any critically ill patient we have apache score which is widely followed that is acute physiology and chronic health evaluation and sap score that is simplified acute physiology score we have sofa score sepsis related organ failure assessment we have mortality prediction models we have multiple organ dysfunction scores and we have logistic organ dysfunction score and to monitor delirium we have cam icu scale and if you look at subarachnoid hemorrhage if you are working in a neuro critical care unit uh, so you get subarachnoid hemorrhage patients and then you have different scoring systems for sah you have hunt and husk grading system we have world federation of neurosurgical society scale and we have fisher scale ct grading uh, to look for vasospasm and in trauma if you look at uh, the gcs gcs is not a critical care scoring system but still we follow uh, the gcs in the neuro intensive care units we have a revised trauma score we have emergency trauma risk assessment scores and then uh, like uh, and we have based on the anatomy in the trauma we have abbreviated injury score we have organ injury score we have injury severity score we have anatomic profile penetrating abdominal trauma index we have trauma mortality prediction model different scores for different uh, diseases these scoring systems are basically divided based on the disease and based on the physiology of the uh, ill critically ill patient and based on the anatomical side so for stroke we have aspect score that is based on the ct we uh, score the uh, stroke whether it is mild stroke or severe or moderate and we have nih, NIH uh, stroke scale and if you look at the cardiac in the cardiology we have cardiac intensive care timi score to look at the flow when you do angio whether it is total occlusion or partial occlusion and then we give timi grading and then we have timi risk score we have chart score and we have uh, for a cardiac surgery for cardiac surgery patients these apache scores and the sap scores will not apply so you need special uh, scoring system for a patient who is undergoing cardiac surgery so these are society uh, like sts score that is society of thoracic surgery risk score and then we have a euro score the european system for the cardiac operative risk evaluation and we have for the pancreatitis we know all of us know ransons criteria we have ct severity score that's called balta hazard scoring system we have simplified prognostic criteria in acute pancreatitis we have bisap score we have revised atlanta classification and when it comes to gi critical care in acute liver failure all of us know the kings college hospital criteria for liver transplantation we have west heaven criteria for hepatic encephalopathy we have mel scoring we have child book scoring and then when it comes to upper gi bleed we have blatch ford score which is very important so in it is not possible to uh, like cover all the scores as why i was uh, I, i thought i will introduce the scoring systems uh, what we use in intensive care unit but uh, most commonly used scores we are going to discuss now the earliest attempt to quantify severity of illness in a heterogeneously uh, critically ill patients was uh, uh, was uh, uh, like uh, actually des- uh, designed by cullen and in 1981 since last 30 years we are like we are using we started using scoring systems and we constantly we are improvising these scoring systems so uh, acute physiology and chronic health evaluation scoring system and after that we have simplified acute physiology scores and then we have mortality prediction models so what are the advantages of quantifying the critical illness with scores and relating this to outcome so a common language for the discussion of the severity of the illness otherwise you you don't know all the patients are not very sick in icu some patients are very stable some patients are very sick so uh, even if, if a stable patient dies suddenly if the patient dies that is not acceptable so you need common language to discuss the severity of the illness a method by which a critical care practice and processes can be compared uh, within or between the units so the provision of risk assess adjusted mortality predictions facilitating acuity uh, comparisons for the clinical trials and indication of likely post icu morbidity and survival so when you are doing uh, family meetings you have to tell them what is the risk of mortality uh, and then uh, what is the risk uh, like post icu morbidity 
all these things you need to discuss with the patient family members so what are the limitations of this scoring system there is no ideal scoring system so there are limitations for all the scoring systems that's why we are constantly we are improvising the scoring systems we have apache 1 we have apache 2 3 and apache 4 the most commonly used score in most of the hospitals is apache 4 system so the the limitations are like cannot it cannot uh, provide the individual patient prognosis and it cannot be meaningfully used for the treatment decisions the scores were de derived from a very large cohorts of heterogeneous patients and the prognostic output is mortality probability estimate for a similar cohort but not an individual so so that's why individually you cannot uh, predict or we cannot uh, but for a group of patients, you can identify uh, the probability of mortality uh, by using these scoring systems. So if you look at uh, the scoring systems, as I said, uh, 30 years back, these scoring systems started, uh, they started using. And the initially, the SAP score, which was the design in France and with a cohort of around 600 patients, SAPS 2 in 1993 with 13,000 patients, SAPS, SAPS 3, it is 16,000 patients. So then we got mortality prediction models from US, from American ICUs. So European ICUs, they were, they were following SAP score. In American ICUs, they were following mortality prediction uh, models. And then again, in the American hospitals from 1981, there are two scoring systems. One is to predict the mortality, that's called mortality prediction models. And then they have Apache scores, 1981, the first Apache score came and all these scores, they monitor in first 24 hours. So if you look at the initial scores, the cohort size, sample size is very less, 600 to 800 patients. Later, if you look at the Apache uh, 4, they have taken nearly 1,10,000 patients from 104 intensive care units from US. And, and then in, U in UK, they have, they follow both the uh, ICNR, C scale and Apache score, scores. And so what are the factors indicating the severity of illness? So uh, as I said, in Apache score, there are two components. One is acute physiological disturbance and then the primary pathological process causing physiological disturbance. And then you need to take ACE, comorbid states and the physiological reserve of the patient when you are uh, scoring that patient. So coming to acute physiological disturbance, an untreated physiological insult can increase the uh, increasing compensatory activity in order to retain the vital organ function. But most of the compensatory mechanisms are neuroendocrine responses to maintain tissue oxygenation. So compensatory signs, we know patients will hyperventilate, patients will have tachycardia, oliguria, so, uh, oliguria and they will have associated cerebral dysfunction or the hallmarks of early untreated critical illness. Then you get the patient to the ICU or ER and then you start resuscitating these patients. So if the patient decompensates, so if you allow the patient to decompensate, they will have hypotension, metabolic acidosis, and they become stuporose, and uh, and you have you can your score will increase in the scoring systems. So the most of the scores arbitrarily look first 24 hours after the admission to the intensive score unit, uh, intensive care units. So we have two types of score. One is uh, like they, they score the patient within 24 hours, single scoring system, and then we have repetitive scoring systems. So like, uh, like you repeat these scoring systems after 24 hours, after 48 hours, after 72 hours. So, but, uh, but these scores, you need to get prior admission, before fluid administration, before antibiotic treatment, before ventilation, before inotrope start, but difficult to get these scores before uh, uh, prior to admission. So that's why we take these scoring systems in first 24, 24 hours after admission. The potential reversibility of a primary pathological process with specific therapies also greatly influence the outcome. So you need to know what is the primary pathology and failure to identify organisms. If you don't identify the multidrug resistant organisms, and if you don't identify the source of sepsis, then your outcomes are bad and uh, your prediction can go wrong. So increasing ACE uh, is reduced the capacity to respond to any insult. So that's why increasing ACE has got high score. And early decompensation, some patients which are like smokers, alcoholics, they decompensate very early. So the physiological reserve is a term that hints at the likely ability to cope with an insult and its physiological demands. It is often inferred from the A's and comorbidity. So you need to incorporate A's and comorbid state 
to see the physiological result and then you have to incorporate these two things into your, into your scoring systems so when you are designing the scoring system the principles behind uh, behind this design are the choice of independent physiological variables and their timing and developing a scoring methodology and its validation and then you have to construct the roc car and then you need to calibrate and then you have to see the specificity and sensitivity of these scoring systems in uh, in um, in given population so if you look at uh, sensitivity the sensitivity is proportion of observed deaths correctly predicted to die this is a true positive so sensitivity if you see if it is uh, like if your observed deaths are 450 and then the predicted deaths are 490 the sensitivity is uh, 0.92 which is very very good specificity is the proportion of survivors correctly predicted to survive so that is true negatives if you look at specificity if uh, like uh, 410 are uh, the survivors and then you predicted 510 and then the specificity is 0.8 so you need to have the specificity and sensitivity of all the scoring systems so uh, we we commonly followed scoring system is apache score we have one two three four and first it was designed by corners in 1981 and then uh, based on the physiology, based on the A's, based on the comorbid conditions. But, uh, and then uh, uh, like this, this is for the different case mix. And then they compared the outcomes and then they evaluated new therapies and they used to study the util utilization of the ICU. So you can decide which patient, what is your admission criteria into ICUs based on your scoring systems. So in, in 1985, they improvised and then we got Apache's two scoring system in 1991 we got apache three scoring system in apache four was introduced in 2006 and this is the most commonly used now so we have two parts in apache score aps this is very important because you need to you need to monitor for all your patients you need to write down your apache scores for your patients so you need to understand what is apache aps is acute physiology score so representing the degree of acute illness there are two parts as i said two components CHE is chronic health evaluation, so indicating physiological reserve before the acute illness. The APS is uh, APS variables were developed by a panel of physicians from the medicine, surgery, and anesthesia, and 34 variables were selected and relative weights, uh, weights uh, were assigned according to the clinician's clinical experience and review of the literature. The greatest degree of abnormality of uh, each variable within first 32 hours after admission was used if you look at the gcs we take the best score if the patient has uh now if the patient has m5 after one hour if the patient has m4 so we say m4 or if one hand m5 the other hand m4 we take the best score that is m5 but in apache and in all critical care scoring systems you have to take the worst value in first 34 hours you have to take the worst score if the heart rate is 150 and even if it comes down to 120 you have to take 150 because that is the worst value So the CHC uh, consisted of questionnaire inquiring about the number of recent physician visits. So how do you evaluate chronic health? You have to find out their uh, recent phys physician visits, activities of daily living, and presence of any malignancy. The patients were classified uh, into A for excellent health if they have, D for severely failing health, and the final score consists of both APS, acute physiology score, and then CHC. If, uh, if the D, if they're severely, um, like uh, the chronic health is not good, then you give the scoring score as D. And then for the APS, you have 25. So you can say 25 D. The probability calculations were not part of the original Apache system. So the criticisms for original Apache included the large number of variables and 32 hours allowed for the data collection. So 32 hours is too long by the time you stabilize the patients. So 32 hours is too long. So that is one uh, one of the flaws in the Apache, initial Apache scoring system. So they modified and then they got Apache 2 scoring system. In the Apache 2, there are only 12 variables. And then for the A's, they have given six points, chronic health, five points. So they have given points to the A's and chronic health. And and then they have given a score based on the patient case. So this is Apache 2 classification. They, they have taken temperature, mean arterial pressures, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygenation by looking at the F, uh, FiO2, FiO2 by, uh, and then the PaO2, and then the serum sodium, arterial pH, 
and then uh, they looked at the creatinine hematocrit wbc count glasgow coma score and then they got the acute physiological score that is the 12 variables and then they took chc and in the chc they looked for the age they have given points for the chronic health they have given points and uh, and then they get they got the apache scores and then like this you need to enter one is aps points and the other one is age uh, age how many points you give and for chronic health how many points you give and then you get the total, total apache 2 scoring system but as i told previously the cabg patients were placed in a separate category and eliminated from overall analysis due to their unique situation of high in initial uh, physiological variables and but their heart rate may be high and their bp may be low or high so but they have low mortality so their physiological variables are not uh, not fitting into the mortality prediction so the cardiac surgery patients were excluded from all these scoring systems and then they have a separate scoring system so each three point increase in apache 2 was associated with an increase in hospital mortality so it is significant so if you look at this uh, table so if you look at the predicted mortality and observed mortality it is almost good and almost uh, same so the specificity is uh, good with apache 2 score uh, system and in uh, they have taken nearly 5000 patients in apache apache 2 in apache 3 was based on the large database of around 18000 patients from 40 intensive care units from us and the patients were admitted for less than 4 hours uh, but they excluded few patients if they are uh, like if they are burns patient if they are uh, chest pain patients so they were if they are they are admitted for only few hours then they have excluded from the scoring system and CABG patients excluded Apache three represented an advanced uh, like advanced scoring system uh, and then it has got better ROC and better uh, calibration specificity than Apache two. So the score uh, they have given around 299 is the maximum uh, uh, variable, uh, score. For the physiology, you get around 20 to 252 scores and chronic health 0 to 23 and for age 0 to 24. And it is referred as a Pachi 3 scoring system. So there are only 17 physiological variables. They have taken acid-based disturbances. They have taken GCS based on the worst. So you have to take the worst GCS score and then you have to incorporate an ACE and then seven comorbidities uh, they have taken into the Apache 3 scoring system. So they have given both, uh, they have given four points for increase in blood pressure or decrease in blood pressure. So, so they have given uh, a zero to four uh, scoring points in Apache uh, 3 for all the variables, all the physiological variables. They have taken acid-based disturbances, ABG into consideration. And then they have taken GCS, they have inc incorporated in Apache 3. For the A's, they have given 24 points based on the A's and they have given if they are uh, 45 to 50, 60, they get five points if they're 85, more than 85, 24 points. And then comorbid conditions, AIDS has got high uh, high points. If somebody uh, coming with AIDS, they're immunocompromised, their mortality will be high. So they have given 23 points. Hepatic failure, lymphoma, metastatic cancers, leukemia, immunosuppression, cirrhosis, all these uh, comorbidities will carry some points coming to apache 4 so apache 4 was based on a new database of more than 130000 patients admitted into one, 144 intensive care units in different uh, 45 different american hospitals so the auc roc derived from the model used on a validation database was 0.88 indicating a very good discrimination the apache 4 system has not been tested outside the us that is the flaw that is the drawback therefore it needs Calibration in the rest of the world, but we are using, we are in most of the now you know, outside US, a lot of hospitals are using Apache 4. Indeed, this might also be the case in the US, given in selected units, uh, which they have not taken for the database. So, this is a very, very important slide for all of you. This slide has to be, this picture has to be, this printout has to be there in each and every patient file, and then you need to score Apache uh, for all the patients. So, we have now on the on your uh, uh, on your iPhones, you can download that app. And then when you put all these variables, if you put age, temperature, map, heart rate, respiratory rate, mechanical ventilation, S or no, FiO2, PaO2, PCO2, PC, pH, sodium, urine output, urea, blood sugar, albumin, bilirubin, weight, WBC, GCS. If when you when you put all these things uh, into your app, you will get a scoring system. And then the chronic health condition, uh, you, you have to see for these chronic uh, health issues, and then you have to tick, and then 
you have to uh, get some information so admission information uh, like uh, uh, whether he was admitted for emergency surgery whether it is a readmission so that you have to enter and then uh, like uh, what is the admission diagnosis you need to enter if it is a stroke did you thrombolize or not you have to enter then you get apache 4 scoring system the maximum score is 286 for the aps we have 239 points and estimated mortality you will get and then you will get estimated length of stay so the icu uh, when you are doing family meeting they will be asked you how many days doctor how many days this patient is going to stay in your hospital in your icu then you need to give some answer based on your scientific data you cannot you may not you cannot say oh i think one week oh i think 10 days no so you will get estimated length of stay when you fill all these parameters and then when you get a score but uh, but but to get this scoring system, do you want to do ABGs for all the patients? Do you want to do sodium for all the patients? Do you want to do albumin for all the patients? If the patient is in surgical ICU, you are monitoring post-op uh, surgical patient. But when I ask you to monitor for Apache 4, uh, Apache 4 score, and then if you write albumin, bilirubin, hematocrit for this patient, so the bill will go up and uh, they will not accept. So you have to assume few things in if the if it is a post surgical patient when the pre uh, pre op uh, albumin everything is like if they are normal if you think uh, abc is normal you have not done abc then you can assume these things and then you can fill and then you can get the apache 4 uh, scoring system so with this you know the observed mortality and predicted mortality you will get uh, smr that is standardized mortality rate if you look at uh, apache 4 so the observed mortality and predicted mortality both are almost equal the smr is uh, like uh, the specificity is 0.99 and it is much much better than apache 3 and uh, apache 2 so for apache 4 has got better specificity so coming to the next scoring system that is sim simplified acute physiology physiology score uh, and then even uh, sap scoring system they have one to three. The simplified acute physiology score was originally based on data derived from French ICUs. So we discussed American ICUs. Now we are moving towards uh, European ICUs, French ICUs. So they, they follow the simplified acute physiology score based on almost entirely on acute physiological variables. In Apache, they have taken in a chronic health evaluation, that is they have taken comorbidities and then they added physiology, physiology scores. But here we are depending only on the physiological variables. There are 14 physiological variables which they monitor in first 24 hours. Unlike Apache 2, this system included neither diagnostic categories nor chronic health status as a part of severity illness to estimate. So these are the 14 variables they used in SAPS, age, uh, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, body temperature, spontaneous uh, respiratory rate, ventilation or CPAP, urine output, blood urea, hematocrit, almost all the parameters are same as uh, uh, Apache physiological variables. And then they are given 0 to 4 uh, scoring. If the heart rate is high, uh, if more than 180, you will get a 4 score. If it is less than, uh, less than again, 75, like less, less than, uh, around uh, for, uh, 46 to 55, you'll get one score like that they divided. You know, if the heart rate is less than 40, if the patient is extremely bradycardic, you will get a high score. And if it, the patient is extremely tachycardic, then you will get a high score. So, <clears throat> and high sodium will get high score, low sodium will get again high score. So these are the physiological variables we see in SAPS. So this was published uh, uh, in the Critical Care uh, Medicine Journal, a, simple, a simplified acute physiological score for ICU patients. Um, again, this was published in uh, way back in 1984. So the SAP score, the SAP, the SAP score increases, the mortality increases. So if you see the mortality, if the SAP score more than 21 are equal to 21, the mortality is 81. So they've taken um, a few hundreds of patients in this analysis. So uh, the 1993 SAPS2 was introduced again in based on the European and North American patients. They've taken nearly 13,000 patients and they've taken 12, uh, they excluded patients under uh, 14 years, 18 years, say, patients with burns. As I told, they excluded patients with cardiac risk or cardiac surgery patients in all the scoring systems. So the 12 physiological measurements, age, type of admission, uh, specific chronic health conditions such as presence of AIDS. So in SAPS 2, they incorporated this 
chronic health issues like AIDS, malignancy, cirrhosis, metastasis, and they have taken the score within first 24 hours of ICU admission. And the score is 0 to 163 points. In Apache 4, we have seen there are 286 points. Here, 0 to 163 points. So the, the ROC was 0.86. The specificity is uh, um, like equal to your Apache 3 or MPM 3. So this is the SAPS uh, 2 score. They have taken chronic disease. They have taken type of admission, whether they whether it is scheduled surgical admission or emergency surgical admission, based on that based on that the score will increase. So when you when you see the relationship between the SAP score and the mortality, it is a sigmoidal relationship curve. So if you see the if it the points are more than seventy seven, the total points are one sixty three. But if the points are more than seventy seven, then the mortality is more than ninety. So it's a sigmoidal uh, curve. So coming to SAPS-3, uh, which was uh, designed based on uh, 300 ICU patients data, 16,000 patients, they have taken 20 variables and the score decreased to 127. So, <clears throat> so they have taken separated variables. So they have assessed the patient health prior to admission, and then uh, they gave different uh, scoring system. Uh, they have given different scoring system based on the patient characteristics before admission, age, comorbidities, length of stay before ICU admission. They have taken the previous ICU admission length of stay, and then the hospital location before admission, and then uh, was there any vasoactive medication at the time of admission? So again, they have taken age, comorbidities. Um, uh, they incorporated in SAPS three, SAPS three, and then uh, they included the reason for ICU admission, whether the patient is getting admitted for the rhythm disturbances or whether the patient is getting admitted for the seizures. And then if the patient is getting admitted for the surgery, they have taken anatomical site for the surgery. If it is for transplantation, they will get high score. If the patient is getting admitted for uh, CABZ without valvular repair, they will get around six points like that. They have taken what type of surgery and they have given different scoring systems for uh, each type of surgery. So coming to the next model, that is mortality prediction models, that is MPM 1 to 3. MPM was introduced in 1985. All these scoring systems, all MPM 1 or SAPS or Apache, all these scoring systems were introduced in 1980. And, uh, uh, and then slowly uh, they uh, improved these scoring systems for uh, these 30 years. So uh, 1935 to provide uh, like uh, based on the approach constructing a scoring system, what is the mortality prediction they wanted to uh, predict by using these models. So from a single US institution and included observations at the time of admission to the ICU within first 24 hours, they started with one ICU and then they, this is a repetitive score. They have taken uh, like uh, at the time of admission. So the absence or presence of some physiological or diagnostic features at the time of admission. And again, they have seen these variables after 24 hours in the first ICU day. And the final result is given as a probability of death rather than a score. So this is mortality prediction, not the outcome prediction. Uh, it won't predict your length of stay in ICU. It is only mortality prediction. So it computes the hospital risk of death from the coefficients based on the presence or absence of 15 factors such as coma, chronic renal failure, cirrhosis, heart rate more than 150, systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of uh, mercury and others. So MPM2 is based on the same data set as uh, SAPS2. So whatever parameters we discussed in SAPS2, they followed in mortality prediction model of 2. This system, but as I told, the SAPS you will capture the data within 24 hours. But in mortality prediction models, we it is a repetitive score. You do at 24 hours, and then you do at 48 hours, and then you do at 72 hours with 13 variables. So they excluded burns patient and coronary care patients and cardiac surgery patients. So at the time of admission, you monitor this, whether the patient has arrhythmia, cerebrovascular incident, GI bleed, intracranial mass effect, Yes, CPR prior to admission, mechanical ventilation, non-elective surgery, coma, deep stuporose, heart rate, systolic BP. And at the time of after 24 hours, again, you see, is there any intracranial mass effect, metastatic neoplasm, non-elective surgery, and uh, what is the PAO2, what is the creatinine, what is the urine output, what is the vasoactive drug dose. 
And in 2007, we, they got this mortality prediction model three, which was introduced based on like, because it was noted that MPM2 had lost its calibration against patients who are being recruited into the ongoing project of impact. So this was probably due to changes in the practice rather than case mix. And the data was collected at the time of admission. And with this, uh, the ROC curve is 0.82 is better in mortality prediction three model. So they have taken different parameters. They have taken mechanical ventilation into consideration. They, uh, they have taken uh, whether the patient has CVA or not and uh, other risk factors they have seen. And then they give uh, mortality prediction three values. So uh, in UK, they have a different organization that is Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center. So this ICNARC, the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center in UK is an organization dedicated to collect the data and analyze the critical care data derived from around 160 UK ICUs on a regular basis. So the current ICNARC model was introduced in 2007 and was upgraded with new coefficients in 2011. This model was originally based on 163 general ICUs using data collected between 1995 to 2003. The model ultimately included the data from nearly 2 lakh patients, 2 lakh 15,000 patients, and the readmissions during the same hospital spell were not included in this model. So 12 physiological variables they have taken, which if all uh, all at their worst added up to the score. So the worst score they added to the score. The model was included as a uh, diagnostic category, source of admission, whether the patient had uh, received CPR prior to admission. So in previous scoring systems, the CPR was not included. The model showed high degree of discrimination and calibration when applied to validation set. So its weakness like Apache system is that the entirely based on a one nation cohort and may not be suitable for the outside UK hospitals. So this looking at that ICNRC physiological score, again, the parameters are same heart rate, systolic BP, temperature, respiratory rate, easy to remember all these parameters we can commonly monitor and they are same in Apache, in SAPS, in ICNRC, in mortality prediction, mortality prediction, these are different, but these three uh, scoring systems, these are almost the physiological variables are same. So uh, they looked at the age at the time of admission, the reason for the admission, whether it is emergency surgery or surgical admission or non-surgical admission, interaction between the physiological score and reasons for the admission and CPR within 24 hours prior to admission. This is one important parameter they added into their scoring system. And we know uh, when the patient is getting admitted after cardiac arrest, after CPR, then the mortality will be high. The source of admission and uh, surgical urgency so coming to the organ failure scores, apart from this work from the Apache, so they found they designed organ failure scores, uh, OSF, OSF uh, they defined five organ failure scoring system. The single organ scoring failure, uh, failure lasting more than one month resulted in, in hospital mortality of 40%. If there are two organ failure, then the mortality will increase to 60%. If three or more organ failures, then the mortality will increase more than 98%. So based on the multiple organ dysfunction, they have given a score. So based on the respiratory, renal, neurological, hematological, cardiovascular, and hepatic, five organs they have taken. And the progressive organ dysfunction was measured on a scale of zero to four. The intervals were statistically uh, determined for each organ based on the associated mortality. The summed up score is 24. Maximum is 24, unlike your Apache 286. Here, the maximum score is 24 on the first day score and correlated with the mortality in the graduated fashion. Again, this is a repetitive score. The previous scores are at one time you are uh, scoring the patient, but these multiple organ dysfunction scores are repetitive. You can repeat uh, every day and then you can you can uh, you can write the scoring system. So as I told, they have taken these systems into the consideration respiratory. They looked at the PaO2 by FiO2, renal uh, serum creatinine for the renal, serum bilirubin for the hepatic, cardiovascular, and then hematological platelet count, and then they have checked GCS. So based on the organ failure, the ICU mortality was approximately 25% when the points are 9 to 12. 
And if it, if the points are 20 or more than 20, then the mortality is 75%. Uh, more than 20, the mortality is 100%. 17 to 20, 75% is the mortality. The sequential organ failure assessment, the SOFA scoring, uh, which is very, very commonly used now, the SOFA, and to identify uh, patients in sepsis in the wards, we have QSOFA also. The SOFA, the sequential organ failure assessment, this score was originally constructed to provide a simple score for the daily organ dysfunction in sepsis trials. So it uh, initially for the sepsis trials, they wanted a scoring system, which is uh, based on the organ failure. So they have taken, they have taken SOFA score for most of the sepsis trials. You might have seen the recent trials for the extracorporeal blood purification therapies like uh, cytosop therapies. So when to use cytosop filter and for all these uh, studies, they have taken SOFA score. It takes into account of six organs, as I told in the previous uh, slide, brain, cardiovascular, coagulation, renal, hepatic, respiratory, and scores uh, from zero to four, that is normal to extremely abnormal. So this is the SOFA score, which is very, very important. You need to remember and write it in your exam. So respiration, PaO2 by FiO2 ratio, if it is more than 400, zero, if it is less than four, Coagulation platelets more than 1,50,000, it is zero and less than 20,000, it is four. And then you take liver, bilirubin, you monitor for the liver. And if it is more than 12, you give four points. Cardiovascular, you look at the mean arterial pressures. And then if it is uh, the patient is on epinephrine or norepinephrine, then you give a score of four. And if the patient GCS is less than six, this is the only score a lower score is bad, higher score is good. So even though that's why it's not a critical care scoring, but GCS, low score is bad, high score is good. So in other scoring systems, high score is bad. So in renal, again, if the creatinine is more than five, then you give a score of six, uh, five, uh, sorry, score of four. So you have to score from zero to four, and then <clears throat> you look at uh, lungs, coagulation, liver, heart, CNS, and renal based on these parameters you give sequential organ failure uh, assessment score that is SOFA score. There is one more score called logistic organ dysfunction score an organ failure score that can be used in hospital outcome this is also like SOFA score so logistic organ dysfunction score. So again, this is based on the neurological, cardiovascular, hematological, respiratory, hepatic, and renal. This is also similar to SOFA score. This was published in JAMA 1996. So we completed the sepsis scores, uh, the common scores for the medical ICUs. Now coming to the surgical ICUs and neuro ICUs, we have a trauma score. The injury severity score, score is based on the abbreviated injury score in, injury scale. This is based on the anatomical injury side. Head and neck uh, injury, they have you give some some points. Face, chest, thoracic spine. So based on the anatomy, you give some points. But the disadvantage is they have not taken into physiological variable. Uh, they have not, not taken physiological variable into consideration. So this is basically uh, designed with a more uh, like uh, these automotive industry uh, like. Uh, mobile industry, uh, automobile industry uh, people. And this was published in JAMA 1971. So you can give scoring uh, zero, no injury to five critical and uh, uh, like a moderate, severe, critical, life-threatening injuries based on abbreviated injury severity score from one to six. So injury severity score, uh, you give points one to six, and then you calculate the risk of mortality. So the major trauma defined uh, in the injury severity score, uh, again, uh, they have taken some physiological parameters. And if it is more than 15, you say the mortality is around 10% according to the injury severity score. So again, they have a new injury severity score. They modified, uh, Osler modified, and uh, they have taken both abbreviated injury uh, severity score based on the anatomical region, and then they are given the new score. And then there is one more score called trauma score. In this, they have taken physiological variables also. They have taken capillary refill instead of lactate, like a, so it's not possible to monitor lactate. For a monitoring shock, they have taken capillary refill. And then if it is normal two, and if it is delayed more than two seconds, they have given one. So the respiratory rate, respiratory effort, blood pressure, everything they have taken into consideration. And then they have given the revised trauma score. The revised trauma score is based on again GCS, systolic BP, and the respiratory rate. So they take they have taken both ISS and the RTS, that is the revised trauma score. 
to predict the mortality in a trauma patient. So in a, when you get a trauma patient to your ICU, to the emergency, you need to monitor the revised trauma score or injury severity score or abbreviated injury, injury severity score in your patient. That is very, very important um, because all these cases are medical legal cases. And then you need to monitor these, the, you need to write the scoring systems and then you need to predict the mortality you have to explain to the attendants. So trauma injury severity score, the TRIS, TRIS is also they they have uh, they, from the data of around 30000 patients so and they included the presence of penetrating injury and the age into the tris scoring system if the age is high again the mortality is high so then they have not taken age into consideration in the previous scoring systems so coming to again ascar that is a severity characterization of the trauma this is also introduced for the trauma patients more slightly modified tris so Next, uh, I have another two, three scoring systems, and then I will wind up. This is clinical pulmonary infection scores. So if you have a patient on ventilator, if the patient deteriorates because of ventilator-associated pneumonia, how do you identify? Do you have any scoring systems? So we have a score developed to establish clinical radiographic laboratory markers to detect pneumonia. And then serial clinical pulmonary infection score, uh, uh, like uh, even you can predict the uh, survivors, non-survivors, score more than six suggestive of uh, pneumonia. If it is more than two days, uh, 48 hours, then we say it is ventilator-associated pneumonia. So based temperature, based on temperature, if the temperature is high, you give two points based on TLC, based on the secretions, tracheal secretions, whether they're purulent or mucoid, oxygenation based on oxygenation, you give score based on the chest X-ray. If you have localized opacity, then that is VAP. And progression of the radiological opacities, so then you give high scores. And the cultures, what cultures you are getting from the uh, uh, from the tracheal aspirate. If you get a pathogenic bacteria culture in a heavy quantity, then you give a score of one. So this is uh, CPIS and then you detect uh, VAP in your ICU based on this score. And in 1988, Murray and colleagues proposed an expanded definition of ARDS taking into account of various pathophysiological features in the clinical syndrome. The Murray scoring system included four criteria for the development of acute lung injury or ARDS, a scoring of uh, hypoxemia, scoring of respiratory system complaints and chest radiographic finding and level of uh, positive end expiratory pressure based on your PEEP, based on your chest X-ray findings, based on the respiratory compliance, based on the hypoxemia. The Murray has given a scoring system for the ALI or ARDS patients. So based on this scoring system, you can decide. So when to go for advanced ventilation, when to use, when to go for ECMO, and you need to, you need to write the Murray scoring system into your case sheet when you are treating an ARDS patient. So each criteria receives a score of 0 to 4 according to the severity of the condition. The final score is obtained by dividing the collective score by the number of components that were used. So if the score is 0, there's no lung injury. If the score is 1 to 2.5, mild to moderate lung injury. If the score is more than 2.5, then there is a presence of ARDS. So this is the score given. Chest X-ray score, no alveolar consolidation, one. If the alveolar consolidation confined to one quadrant, uh, so one is a, if it is no, then zero. And if it is two quadrants, two, and three quadrants, three, four quadrants, it is four. And the hypoxemia, PaO2 by FiO2, we know, we monitor ABGs. And then if it is more than 300, then it is zero. And if it is less than 100, you give a score of four. And PEEP, if it is less than or equal to five, you give zero. If the PEEP is more than 15, you give a score of four. The respiratory system complaints, if it is more than 80 ml per centimeter of water, the complaints is good, then you give a score of zero. If the complaints is less than 19 ml per centimeter uh, of water, then you give a score of <coughs> four. So, <coughs> so that's how you calculate the Murray score and then you decide your mode of ventilation or whether, the, whether to go for prone ventilation or whether to go for ECMO based on your Murray score. So we discussed, uh, initially we discussed uh, the common scores we use for sepsis. Uh, 
uh, we used uh, like we discussed about the, about the apache score we discussed about uh, sap score we discussed about the mortality prediction scores and then we, then we entered that uh, after apache we have seen this trauma scores and then we have discussed about the abbreviated injury score and then the revised trauma score and uh, and then we have seen the scoring system for the rds and detect the pneumonia intensive care unit uh, and then we have different uh, disease specific scoring systems I have not gone into that <clears throat> i think when you're discussing pancreatitis you will discuss about the ransom's criteria bicep criteria you will be discussing about the bald hazard scoring system when you're talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage you will be talking about uh, fissures Fisher's grade and then WFNS grading and uh, Hunt and Hust grading. Like I'm not going into disease specific scoring systems, but I generally discuss the general scoring systems, what we use in intensive care unit I discussed. And these, uh, this, uh, I think uh, this lecture is available on YouTube and then the slides you can take. Uh, it is good for you to prepare for the exam. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to answer a few questions. Thank you, Subha. It's an excellent uh, uh, lecture. So uh, we will take up some questions. Now, uh, before going into the questions, I have a small doubt. What scoring system used people strictly follow in your critical care unit in this? Uh, 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 like uh, the Rajesh, across the Apollo group. So we have, we have, we in, we integrate all our critical care services. So we uh, generally we have a, a regular meeting, and then recently in our meetings uh, we decided because each unit was following different scoring system. Some units they were following sofa scoring, and some units they were following uh, uh, like uh, so some unit. Most of the units were following sofa scoring, and now some units were following Apache four. But now we decided across all the hospitals so we should follow apache 4 uh, scoring system and then it is very easy uh, you have an app and then you put all the parameters into that app you will get a score you will get an acute physiolo physiology score and then you get a chc score and then you will get total apache score and then uh, and then based on your and then it gives the predicted mortality and then it gives the predicted length of stay so you can talk to the patient family members and tell so this is the predicted mortality this is the length of stay and then you you monitor the observed mortality and then you can monitor the standardized mortality rate so it is mandatory now in all the intensive care units if you are nabh accredited you should have this standardized mortality rate to look at the quality of your intensive care units. If you look at only crude mortality, that will not give you any information if you have crude mortality. So some ICUs will get very sick patients and the mortality is high. Some patients, uh, some ICUs, they get very stable patients, but if the mortality is high, it is not acceptable in those ICUs. So you need to have this kind of uh, scoring system. We follow Apache 4, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, will these scoring systems, will they alter our management process or it is only for prediction of the mortality and the outcome? Uh, excellent question. So management, definitely uh, how the management is, uh, the management uh, prospect, it may not change. So the outcomes, uh, like you can predict the outcomes, you can predict mortality, but um, see some scoring systems, if you're following Murray scoring system for ARDS, so you can plan your management, whether to prone, whether to use ECMO, where, and then if you follow CPIS scoring system, you can, and then you can detect VAP, and then you can uh, you can treat VAP. So that helps in uh, management. So other um, uh, other scoring systems are basically to compare the quality of your ICUs and uh, to see the outcome of patients. But again, the cost will increase when you when you do so many investigations, the cost will increase that we have to keep in mind. So you need not do if you think uh, if, like ABC is norm, uh, if you think you, if there's no need to do ABC, then no need to do ABC. For the scoring system, you should not increase the cost of the patient. Um, uh, the SOFA score is the very commonest question being asked. Can you please highlight on that SOFA scoring system, how much you apply that scoring system in your practice? Oh. SOFA yeah. scoring. SOFA scoring system is a very simple so scoring system. So unlike Apache, unlike SAPS, you have so many variables. So in the SOFA scoring system, you have sequential organ function assessment. You take six organs, you take, uh, you take uh, lungs, you look at the PAO2 by FIO2 ratio. You look at hematological system, you take the platelet count, and then you give a score rating. 
uh, for scoring. And then you look at the bilirubin, and then you look at the GTS. So th with these parameters, uh, you look at the mean arterial pressures, whether the patient's vasopressor requirement is high or not. So with this, you get a score. And as unlike the Apache score, you are monitoring only once, that is once in 24 hours. So far score is a repetitive score. You monitor every day. So, and then you can know whether the patient is progressive, uh, like uh, patient is improving or deteriorating. If the argon failure score, if it is increasing, then if the, your patient mortality is increasing. And then that will guide your treatment also. If the SOFA score is high, then I would like to use uh, I would like to use extracorporeal therapies. I want to go for if uh, vasopressor requirement is going high, then I decide okay the patient is going into cytokine storm. I can use cytosol filter or I need to change the antibiotic. I need to uh, go for uh, like a, mm, a renal replacement therapy or based on your SOFA score, your organ support level also will improve increase based on SOFA score. So and people thought even SOFA score is cumbersome. And then they got Q so far. So if the patient is in the ward, and then if you follow, uh, like uh, uh, there are only three parameters, systolic blood, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and alter sensorium. And then if the patient is uh, in the ward, and then if there is any increase, any decrease in sensorium or drop in systolic blood pressure, increase in heart, uh, respiratory rate, you identify in, uh, and then uh, immediately identify, and then uh, you uh, you uh, uh, like announce uh, sepsis code and shift the patient to the intensive care unit. So the cue so far is very, very simple to follow by the nurses and uh, like uh, in the in the wards. But the cue so far will not be applicable for an intensive care patient. Already patient is sick and then you need to pro follow proper so far scoring system. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Subha, for uh, enlightening us with your uh, great lecture here. Uh, I don't find any other questions in the chat box. Uh, Edward, sir, do you have any question to ask? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the extensive coverage of the scoring system. Sir. It's excellent. It will be. I hope it will be helpful to the postgraduate to write the exam, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Subha. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'll be very happy to participate in any of any of the lectures in future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Edward, sir, over to you for the second session. Okay, sir. So we will move on to the second topic that is uh, ventilator graphics by Dr. Sandra Sayer, sir. He is a professor and head of Department of Critical Care Medicine from Institute of Gastroenterology Sciences and Organ Transplant, IGOT. Bangalore, Karnataka. He is the author of the book, Mechanical Ventilation, Clinical Application. So over to you, sir. My screen is visible, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning to all the uh, seniors and my colleagues and, uh, of course, my students. I think probably not much seniors. I'm, a, <laughs> I think, uh, one of the senior faculty. Uh, so, having finished how to safely ventilate the patient and modes, the present uh, today's topic is about uh, respiratory system graphics. Uh, respiratory system graphics is very, very important because it, uh, it is like an investigation which is in the real time. You have to understand and appreciate that you are seeing when you are giving a tidal volume with whatever the rate, whatever the peak, when the intensity, intensive property which has been set, what it reacts to the capacity of the lung and what pressures and what kind of alterations occur. See, in the present day practice, if you don't understand respiratory graphics and know how to interpret and how to make ventilatory adjustments, you cannot produce a lung protective ventilation. Some part of it, looking at the plateau pressures, driving pressures, I have explained it to you. There are other things like secretions, like a bronchospasm, like a autopy. Things like this also can be very well made out using respiratory graphics. But the main crux of it is to be within the parameter of lung protective ventilation. That is what we have to understand. The whole uh, respiratory system graphics assessment would be to keep the patient within the framework of uh, uh, I would say lung protective ventilation. We know what are the settings that we do. A little alteration in the settings because we have a range. If you talk about tidal volume, we talk of 6 to 8 mm. So who requires 6, who requires 8 is all, all in the focus of keeping the patient within the framework of lung protective ventilation. And also some observation, some pathologies also can be observed when you know how to understand respiratory system graphics. 
uh, from last teaching from last 20 years what i have observed is students think that it is very difficult to analyze and understand respiratory rhythms very very easy it is very simple and if you know how to understand how to pick up a few pathological uh, uh, situations and how to keep the patient within the lung protective ventilation most of the lung uh, respiratory system uh, graphics would be of uh, you you would have taken the best out of the respiratory system graphics so how do you monitor a patient on a ventilator whether it is anesthesia or icu obviously you should never ever uh, forget the sign and uh, the clinical signs i have seen most of the younger colleagues don't even uh, wear a stethoscope now in the icu and they find it very awkward to go and uh, auscultate somebody's chest but it gives lot of information that should not be uh, away from uh, a routine uh, kind of a practice blood gas estimation i think most of us in a stable patient it, it has i have seen it has become a routine everybody gets a blood uh, abg in the morning so it should not be a practice same with the chest x ray also so you have to have a reason to get a abg if somebody doesn't have hypotension or is not having any alterations with the base deficit or lactate and if the spo2 and dtco2 are within the range there is nothing you can get out of a blood gas so lot, most of the information can be got got out with a pulse oximetry gapnography chest scan ct scan and ultrasound i have uh, probably missed putting ultrasound ultrasound gives more information because you can keep on doing it repeatedly whereas chest x ray once in the morning it is if somebody has a change so probably you can't do so ultra lung ultrasound is a very uh, kind of a uh, skill that every anesthesiologist it, it, it has applications for putting lines and also you can look at uh, if the patient has had any pneumothorax or uh, any alteration pulmonary edema all things all these things can be easily made out with a uh, lung ultrasound it's very very easy to learn probably within a week uh, most of us uh, would be able to uh, interpret most of the uh, clinical uh, um, abnormalities normally we see with the patients so graphics is like you put in a tube and you pass air if you compare it to a ultrasound where you put in a probe and there is ultrasonic waves here the air itself acts as a kind of a probe and the the uh, yeah, equivalent to a ultrasound wave and it goes and reacts i have been saying this that a intensive property what we said and the capacity of the lung they both interact and we get lot of changes or normal uh, parameters then once we know how to analyze that then you can monitor the respiratory it is like it gives a uh, gives the insight into respiratory mechanics which uh, provides whether the lung is normal or any pathophysiology is happening in the lung and it's always real time it's there for if you are anesthetizing somebody for 4 hours you have this coming out with every breath that is the best and the whole idea is to provide a lung protective ventilation that is what we have to understand we have to keep the patient within the framework of lung protective ventilation so if you compare this to a ultrasound whereas you have to do ultrasound every every minute uh, if you do ultrasound and in the morning you, re- you have to repeat this the ventilator graphics are not there it's real time it's always there it's always there so it, the images are analyzed to gain insight into the pathophysiology of the lungs and obviously do the alterations in the settings of the ventilator so that we are within the framework of the lung protective ventilation that's the beauty of the respiratory graphics is the standard of care if you don't know how to analyze respiratory graphics basic understanding probably we should not be ventilating our patients because it gives a lot of information and it's real time this is the equation of motion for mechanical ventilation i have said this i have shown this to you in most of our patients the patient has been paralyzed sedated and paralyzed anesthetized so the whole component of overcoming the resistance and the compliance is given or driven by the ventilator so when we speak of airways you have to think of the ventilator tubings and the patient's airways that is the a part part of when we say resistance resistance component is exerted by the respiratory uh, uh, 
system with the airway system of the patient and also the uh, endotracheal tube and the ventilator circuit that has to be factored in whenever you see something is happening or you do a inspiratory pause and you get a high trans airway pressure see the contribution can be from the patient also from the tube and also from the uh, ventilator circuit so that is the airways when we talk of airways in the equation of motion you have to consider all this and when we talk of compliance i have said two things we have to compare one is the lung and the chest wall so sometimes once the peak pressures go up and plateau pressures go up the as they are in a series as i have shown in the last uh, lecture they are in a series the contribution can from the book can be from one component either the lung or the chest wall or can be from both for example when we have a patient when we have intubated a patient suddenly the patient the cardiac uh, the kind of a ejection fraction around 30 40% uh, comes for a surgery suddenly patient may develop a pulmonary edema then the contribution is from the lung or when you put pneumoperitoneum for laparoscopic surgeries or when you do some positional alterations suddenly if the plateau pressures goes up then it can be chest wall so the differentiation can only occur if you go on, you can make out uh, scientifically by putting a uh, esophageal balloon for estimation of pleural pressure but most of the times in anesthesia i would say it is very very easy with whether the contribution is from the chest wall or from the lung it is obvious most of the time sometimes in rare occasions it can be both and then also once you look at the clinical signs it it would be obvious to the uh, uh, anesthesiologist so the two things you have to understand here i have been stressing on this fact that once your plateau pressure goes up pip goes up if it is if you think that the lung is normal you ask it you clinically see you have done something where the uh, chest wall has been uh, has been restricted then the pressures go up then you can be more bold you can move move the parameters of the lung productive ventilation little further where you can uh, give a peep of 10 and you can have a, a plateau pressure of 20 25 is acceptable because we know just because somebody is in a river strandland bar with a pneumo peritoneum probably this is happening so what i want to underscore here is the whole understanding of a post graduate should be once you anesthetize a patient and once you see a pip and a plateau before you start with the incision then so any alteration you have to see whether the trans airway pressure is more or the plateau pressure is more if the plateau pressure is more there can be of two components one is lung or chest wall whenever it is of the chest wall you can be more uh, what do you say more aggressive with the peep and recruitment maneuvers if it is the lung probably a primary medical correction is may be required just a ventilator is not going to save if somebody has a uh, pulmonary edema probably he'll require a lasix he'll require a inotrope that is what you have to understand the lung Uh, pathology cannot be corrected it can be supported by decreasing the uh, afterload to an extent but the whole medical aspect has to be factored in like aspiration like aspiration so you have to factor in the medical therapy when you are looking at the resistance component always consider that airways and endotracheal tubes and the circuits also has to be factored in so this is what we have learned if you go back not understanding anything else that i am going to teach from here i don't mind if you always know that the first pressure when you intubate you do the normal settings you get is the peak pressure and you put a inspiratory hold in a volume control in a volume control with a inspiratory hold you get a plateau pressure the difference between plateau pressure and peak is the driving pressure if you have these three pressures and if you know plateau pressure the contribution can be from the lung and the chest wall and it is always a clinical decision because we don't put a esophageal balloon and look at the pleural pressures and if the difference between the pip and plateau is large it is called the trans airway pressure the contribution is from the from airway spasm or kinking or whatever see these things if you are able to ascertain on a patient whom you are anesthetizing my job is done my four lectures i would say Uh, are fruitful to my postgraduates if they understand this much 
I don't mind if you don't understand what I'm going to teach. And probably once you understand the concept of analyzing what is happening to either the contribution is from the or the pathology is from the tubes or the airway or the lung and chest wall and make the necessary arrangements and do the necessary alterations and keep the patient always in the lung protective zone. I think my lectures for the past two weeks is fruitful. I hope I, I have driven home. And in fact, if you look at most of the ventilation, if it may be organophosphorus, it may be ARDS, it may be COPD, it is always with the basics of understanding this much. And the rest is adding up and being more uh, once you get experience, probably you will learn. But this is what I want the postgraduates to concentrate and learn. I hope I am very clear. If you have any doubts, I don't mind clarifying here because ultimately this is what I want to the postgraduates to take back to the bedside. Whenever you start with a tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml, then you give a PEEP of 5, IA ratio of 1 is to 2 because the guidelines don't give clarity there. Rate of around somewhere between 12 to 18 should be okay. Then a FIO2 of less than 40%. Then you first pressure you see is PIP. Then you put an inspiratory hold for 2 to 3 seconds, write down the plateau pressure. Then the difference between plateau pressure is the, and the PEEP is the driving pressure. You note down these three things and then start, ask the surgeon to put an incision or put the pneumoperitoneum or change, do a change in the posture. Then any alteration, you know how to work it out. And most of the lung and airway pathology has to be medically managed. Remember this, there is a very small scope for us to work with the ventilator and correct the medical cases. Whereas the chest wall, if you make a decision that it is because of the chest wall, you can be a little more proactive in putting P, accepting more plateau pressures, more driving pressures and, and uh, be aggressive on the recruitment maneuvers. Am I clear? Any doubts in this? Okay. Yeah, as, as there is nothing in the chat box, I'll go ahead. So, I have said in the last uh, week, uh, last session also, that the ventilator generates just the inspiratory flow of gas. It doesn't do anything other than that. And flow occurs only when there is a pressure difference. And Flow for a given time is a tidal volume delivered and this I have already shown you. So you can alter the delivery of tidal volume by increasing the peak inspiratory flow or increasing the time. Increasing the time. This is where the understanding has to be there. Especially in the pressure support ventilation, which is the mode which we use in the ICU for almost like 70 to 80 percent of the time. There is nothing you can alter. IE ratio cannot be altered. Patient controls, rate patient controls. Only trial volume by altering the pressure support we control. And the only way we can alter the inspiratory time is by increasing or altering the rise time. That is increasing the peak flows or shortening the inspiratory time by decreasing the expiratory, time, expiratory trigger sensitivity. This is the understanding that you should have. So they are all interdependent. This is important. You have to understand uh, alveoli is a cul-de-sac, meaning that there is no flow through the system. It has, well, the air has to go through the same tubes and come out through the, the same tubes. So whenever you put a volume into a cul-de-sac, pressure will change. So this is the, uh, depending upon the compliance or whatever the uh, flexibility of the alveoli, the pressure changes will be proportionate. That is what you are, see, people can say compliance, elastance. Your basic understanding should be if the lung is stiffer for a smaller volume, the pressure changes more. Whenever a posture in a volume control, when you change the posture or put a pneumoperitoneum, if the pressures go up, peak pressures go up, you have to understand that there is something happening, something happening. Then you think either it's an alveolar problem or the chest wall problem. And then make the necessary changes. Flow for a certain time is volume delivered and air always chooses the path of resistance. That is the most important concept you have to understand because normally, even in a physiological uh, 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 in a sense also, the lung is not homogeneous. The BQ ratios are not homogeneous. 
in a sick lung or in an anesthetized lung the bases collapse more so the air always chooses to go to the paper area where the alveoli are easy to open so obviously you have to reduce the tidal volume that is the uh, logic for reducing the tidal volume from uh, the 10 to 12 ml which we used to use in the icu also 20 years back to 6 to 8 So, this has been already told. So, this is the lung protective zones. See, you may, you may feel that it's being repeated, but I want, as I said, if you take this information home to your, bed, to, to your bedside, to your bedside and start implementing to your patient, you are always in a lung protective zone. The plateau pressures generally in the, in the normal lung in, uh, under anesthesia could be 17. As I've said, if there is some hemoperitoneum or a posture change, if the plateau pressure goes up to around 20, 24, 25, then you have to think, is my lung all, all right, auscultation, everything looks all right, then probably it is a chest wall issue. Then you can accept it, go up and peep, then don't go up on tidal volume. Just do a recruitment maneuver that should do driving pressures also slightly higher driving pressures. We can accept, but normally driving pressures, when you increase the plateau pressure and the peak, the driving pressures will be around 13, 14, 15 could be acceptable if the, uh, the compromise or the restriction on the chest wall and the diaphragm is very high. So, there are three, see another uh, point I want you to understand to take you further into the scalars and loops is, see as I have said, ventilator gen just generates inspiratory flow. And the purpose of mechanical ventilation is to produce a volume into the alveoli. And as I have said, flow and volume are same. When you look flow in the context of time, it becomes volume. So flow goes into the alveoli. For a, when we give flow for a given time, it becomes volume. Volume into a cul-de-sac produces pressure. So these are the three components, flow, volume and pressure that we are going to plot against the time. And they are called the scalars. They are called the scalars. See, here we are plotting flow with time. That is called flow time scalar. Then volume with time. It is called volume time scalar. Then pressure time scalar. Pressure time scalar, I have shown you. You should all be aware that pressure comes, peak pressure. Then you put a inspiratory hold. You get a plateau pressure and a difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP is the driving pressure. So we are aware with the pressure versus time scalar, but let us also look at flow and volume. Flow also, I have shown you when uh, I spoke about the uh, modes uh, in the last uh, session, but these are the three components for, a, for volume to get into your alveoli. The flow has to be there and flow for a given set, for a, in a, for a time, inspiratory time, expiratory time. When we, when we talk flow in, in the context of time, it becomes volume and volume into a quality sac produces pressure. So all the three, when we plot individually over time, we call it as scalars. So obviously there are three scalars, flow versus time, volume versus time and pressure versus time. And there are two loops, <coughs> PV loop and uh, FV loop. Because there are only two loops, because the whole essence of mechanical ventilation is to push volume into the lung. So we combine pressure and volume and we combine flow and volume. So there are two loops. So here the, there is no time. On the uh, x-axis and y-axis, we plot pressure and volume and again flow and volume. volume the volume is always on the uh, x-axis and the, in the y-axis is pressure or flow. So there are two loops and three scalars. Sorry, I, I, I said, I told that uh, the, in the PV loop, the y-axis is volume and the x-axis is pressure. See, when, whenever we see a scalar, how to identify a scalar is, it always starts from one point and always goes to the direction, right direction. Starts from the point, it never comes back there. It goes from one point towards the right. So that is one way of uh, looking at it. And whenever you see a major present, uh, representation below the baseline, you can be sure that it is 
a flow flow kind of a uh, loop or a scalar see if you go back and see here see whenever there is a representation below the baseline flow has to be a component so it will be flow versus volume loop and once you come here it, it will be a flow versus time scalar whenever you see a representation below the baseline the major representation a flow component will be there so there are three scalars flow pressure and volume and they start from one point and always move to the right see that's how that's how it moves all the pressure volume everything moves like that so what can you what can you definitely differentiate or make out with looking at the flow versus uh, time scalar is you can estimate the auto peak response to uh, nebulization you can understand the modes you can find out the secretions this we have already gone through extensively that peak pressure plateau driving pressure compliance can be estimated in volume the only thing that you can estimate is leak when the volume in the expiratory uh, component doesn't touch the baseline that you can understand there is some leak there is some leak i'll not be looking at uh, volume into time scalar this is the only thing you can make out and this you can remember when the volume doesn't come back to baseline there is a leak if it is more if it is somewhere here only if it is going here the leak is much more sorry if this this goes here and stops here then the arrow becomes bigger that much leak is there so in volume was a time scalar only thing that you can reasonably make out is air leak and that's how it present so volume versus time will be ending here you remember that and when we talk of these scalars you should remember when you are talking of flow everything will be flow you should not add up any pressure here this will be the peak inspiratory flow this will be the peak expiratory flow when you are talking of pressure everything will be pressure the pressure at the baseline will be peak this will be peak inspiratory pressure if you put a plateau for inspiratory hold you will get a plateau pressure then it will be driving pressure all pressures will be always on a pressure versus time scalar this is the tidal volume so this is the leak volume so when you talk of volumes we talk of volumes so you should not combine you should always remember that so this is how you see on a ventilator which is the flow versus time scalar in this can anybody type which is the flow versus time scalar in this and which which mode is this which kind what kind of a flow is it a square pattern or a decelerating pattern and what kind of a mode could it be can somebody type which is the flow time scalar first question which is the flow time scalar two is it a decelerating kind of a flow or a decelerating kind of a flow or a square flow it is not square if you see it is a decelerating flow it is if it is square it has to be square it is a decelerating flow this is a pressure versus time scalar this is square because once the pressure reaches in a pressure support or a pressure control to 20 till the time elapses is there if the pressure is maintained there so it is square whereas if you see on a volume versus time volume in a volume control pressure versus time it will be not like this square it will be like it gradually peaks up and then becomes the maximum pressure at the uh, cycling time only this is a decelerating flow this is not a square flow this is the time versus uh, flow versus time scalar because there is a representation below the baseline see here again it starts from here it will go inspiration then it will come back to inspiration if it doesn't come back if it doesn't come back there is always a pathology here also it go like this then expiration it has to come back you have to remember see there is a representation below the baseline so this has to be flow then there is only volume in both there volume is common so flow versus volume and pressure versus volume should always return to the point of origin if it doesn't return then you have to see whether if there is a loss in the flow or in the pressure where where the problem is there here also you have to see whether it is in the pressure or in the volume where where the pathology is then you can find out you have to see what is the x axis y axis where it is falling short then you will be able to appreciate
See, this is this is the square wave. This is the one we had. This is a decelerating. This is pressure controlled because it is touching the timeline and cycling. Whereas in pressure support, it is cycling above. It's a flow cycled one. X. If you consider the peak flow as X, 25% of the X, it always cycles. It will the both are decelerating, but this decelerates and touches because it time cycled. It has to touch the same time line and then only cycling occurs. And this is how we normally breathe. Sine wave. This is this is the flow patterns that the ventilator is capable of generating. Now present day ventilators in some ventilators in volume control also you can put decelerating so that the as I have said it's, then it doesn't become a fixed flow. But the whole idea of having volume control is in a patient who is paralyzed or passive so that we get to and they will be sicker. Otherwise, why would we ventilate or in anas under anesthesia? Otherwise, we would not put them on volume control, isn't it? At that time, I would always prefer to have a square wave because in a constant flow only, it is better to appreciate the plateau pressures. So, something to remember. These slides, I will send it to uh, uh, Dr. Edwards and uh, uh, Dr. Edwards uh, probably will uh, give it to all the postgraduates or the delegates who have uh, attended. Okay. So, so uh, when we when we see, I have uh, said three zone, three phases of uh, uh, ventilation: trigger, trigger, pressurization, then limiting, then cycling. This is what we understood. So, flow versus time is used to understand modes. That is something we have to understand. That is the, see, this is flow versus time. So, everything will be spoken in flows only. See the peak inspiratory flow, peak expiratory flow. This is the TI. This is the TI. TE. This is one cycle time. This is one cycle time. One cycle time. It is a square wave. Hence, it is a volume controlled ventilation. This much can be assessed. If somebody gives or in, on a ventilator, if you see a decelerating, then see whether it, the cycling is happening above the Timeline or on the timeline. If it is happening on the timeline, it's a pressure control mode. And if it is happening above, then it's a flow cycle, which happens in only one mode, and it is pressure support mode. Can somebody type what is the problem here? Not the only diagnosis. What is it? What, what, what are you seeing in the expiratory phase? Can somebody type? No, I would, I would say this, that the expiratory time is prolonged. TE is prolonged, one. And there is not total emptying of air, as somebody has typed air trapping. Some air is remaining. It's not touching the baseline. This much air is remaining. If it happens from here, probably then the air trapping is more. This is what you can appreciate by looking at this wave. Can somebody say what it is? When the air is coming out, there is it is finding some obstruction. So, there can be water in the circuit or there can be a lot of secretions. So, whenever you see on a flow versus time scalar that on the expiratory uh, limb, there is a lot of serrations, then you can probably do a suction to your patient during anesthesia. You don't have to auscultate also. It is quite accurate. And if there is a lot of water because of a humidifier, which we don't probably use in an ICU situation, humidifier sometimes uh, 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 produces a lot of uh, water particles in the circuit. So, that has to be considered. So, these two things are very easy to pick up. So, these two things you have to remember. See, what is, what is, what is, what, what was here? What was the problem here? And what is the problem here? I have done something to the patient. What have I done to the patient? Type. What has decreased? What is this? And what is this time? This is the peak inspiratory flow. This is the expiratory time. So, the peak expiratory flow has reduced and the expiratory time has increased. 
but there is no definitely not much of a auto peep if the patient also had auto peep what would you do to the patient See, you can find out the response to bronchodilators also. You don't have to look anything further. By looking at your ventilator, uh, you can say, okay, my peak expiratory flows have increased, my TE is in decreased, my ETCO2 is coming up. So, you probably you know, you don't require to do anything. It's all there. Information is all there. The only thing is, you have to know. They always say, no, the IC is what the mind knows. So, it is something you have to remember. So, it also gives you a assessment of how well your bronchodilator has worked. So, understanding modes, I will not go much. See here in a control mode, the triggering, limiting and cycling is all done by the machine in all the modes except one mode that is called the pressure support where triggering and cycling is done by the ventilator. And I have said most of your advanced modes when the patient is are being used to be in the patient or to keep the patient comfortable or to reduce the uh, amount of sedation or to have better synchrony. Most of them are based on pressure support. So, if you don't understand pressure support, you are not going to go much beyond understanding modes. So, there are only three modes. All are kind of a combination of uh, using artificial intelligence and good uh, nanotechnology where the uh, technology or uh, the, there is a understanding by the ventilator of all the parameters we set, what are the changes we ha happen to the patient, then kind of an adjustment that happens. So, so there are volume control and assist volume control, pressure control, assist pressure control and pressure support. These are the only three modes and all the other advanced modes are a combination or a kind of a uh, alteration or a kind of a mixing of these three modes only. So, can somebody type what is the first mode, what is the second mode, what is the third mode? This is flow versus time scalar. There is a great representation below the baseline. This is peak inspiratory flow, peak expiratory flow, TI, TE and total cycle time. This is the information we get. And if the expiration doesn't reach the baseline, starts from the below the baseline only, if the inspiration starts, there is auto peep. And lot of serrations in the expiratory limb always convey secretions. This much you should understand. So, first one is, yes, some, uh, most of you are typing correctly. So, I am happy. So, what is the difference in the pressure support? How is cycling done? Can somebody type? How is cycling done? See, I don't want the lectures to be that I speak and I go home, that you don't take anything back to the bedside. So, I want you to understand, if you have any doubts, you can ask me now, I will clarify. How is the cycling done? How is the, where, which is the only mode where the cycling is done by the patient? Okay, okay, right, everybody are typing correctly, I am happy. Is that understood? See, this always touches the baseline, whereas this happens much Above because at 25 percent of deceleration only it cycles, isn't it? And you can shift it to here also, 50 percent also. In a COPD patient, to cut short the inspiratory time, once I cut short the inspiratory time, I have to deliver the tidal volume faster. So I, I, I increase my peak flows, like filling up the bucket. I have shortened the time, but I want the same amount of water to carry. So what do I do? I open the tap more. So I increase the peak flow. But for, unfortunately, the ventilator companies call that as rise time. So, don't confuse. Whatever they call, we are only increasing the peak flow, increasing the opening the tap for more. Because from two seconds, I have made my time for waiting to fill up one liter in my bucket to one second, then I have to open the tap much faster. The flow has to increase. That is the basic idea of understanding the expiratory trigger sensitivity and the rise time. It is not rocket science. If the peak flow is X, at 25% of the X, it cycles. It is, it is adjustable. By default, it is like that. You can bring it down 
you can bring it up. Bring it up means at 50% year, 75%, you are shortening the inspiratory time. If you are shortening the inspiratory time, obviously you have to increase the peak flow, which is called as the rise time in pressure modes. So this is something all of us understand. This is how it will be. Here, this is the peak inspiratory flow. This is the TI, TE, and this is peak. This is the inspiration. This is the expiration. This we have gone through a lot. Here we get the PIP to come here. We have to, to estimate the plateau pressure. Plateau pressure is the surrogate of a alveolar inspiratory pressure. That is something you have to remember. At the alveoli, of all the alveoli that are open and communicating, not the collapsed ones. But we are more worried about them because they are the normal alveoli. They are the alveoli which are participating in the gas exchange. In the ARDS situation, we would call that as a baby lung. So if you, if you don't safeguard the baby, you will have a good AVG and a dead patient. So remember that. Don't leave the lung protective parameters and go away. For a short time, you may have a SpO2 of 99. I don't want a SpO2 of 99 when a patient is sick. I am happy with 90. Because I know if I have to push more air, I am going to overinflate my baby lung. So that is something you have to remember. So to come to here, you have to put an inspiratory hold for 2 to 3 seconds. And that is the surrogate of end alveolar pressure. And this is the driving pressure. Driving pressure, this is 17, around 12 to 13. 16 to 17 is the parameters that we have to maintain. I would again say this, whenever you anesthetize a patient, put the para lung protective parameters, as I said, you do a, you measure your patient, then on a predicted, but not looking at the patient, it is criminal to guess somebody's weight. And don't put a patient looking at the tidal volume setting, looking at the, or what you measure. It is always based on the height predicted. Then the whole ball you have lost the plot there only. So, um, one of my teachers used to say, your ICU is as good as the number of tapes you have. So, you always have to carry a measuring tape. So, measure the patient, predicted body weight, tidal volume set, peep set, five peep, everything set. First pressure you have to measure is PIP. You don't have to measure, it comes PIP. Then plateau pressure. Then no down. Then write down the driving pressure. Then ask the surgeon to go ahead with the surgery. Any alteration, then you know how to work. I will show you how to work. I have already told you many, many times. I will again go through that. I have, a, uh, if time permits, I have two, three case scenarios also. I will show you how to. And as I have said, it's a uh, to work around so that you have an understanding of what we have to do. End inspiratory alveolar pressure. That is surrogate. See, this is always in series. This is only clinically we make out. And it is, most of the times, it is very easy and obvious. And as I have said, we don't have an obligation to the surgeon. Whenever you find it very difficult to differentiate whether it's a lung problem or a chest wall, you can always ask the surgeon to deflate the abdomen, wait for a minute or change the position. See, once make yourself comfortable, then ask him to go ahead. Now that you make a decision, it is a chest wall, you can be, you can, you can expand the borders of the lung protective ventilation. I think I'll just uh, skip this. I've told you many, many times uh, by, to an extent where uh, people may be getting uh, upset that I'm uh, stressing on the same five things. But this is this is all you have to understand in mechanical ventilation. If you understand this one slide and you work around it, all patients from your OT and ICU go home properly. You take my word. Otherwise, if there is an issue, it is the issue of the uh, primary pathology. And this is something you have to remember. See, this diagram you remember. The difference between PIP and plateau is the resistance component. We call this as trans airway pressure. And this from plateau to PIP is the, the alveolar or the chest wall. Alveolar or the chest wall. You have to remember. And most of the times, if it is a chest wall, it will be very obvious. And you get that by putting an inspiratory hold. And another thing you can also estimate is there is something called an expiratory hold also. In a volume controlled, in a passive patient, by putting an expiratory hold, so you can also look at the estimate the atopy. See, this is this is what kind of a breath? Is it a controlled breath or a triggered breath? 
See, I have set a trigger of minus one centimeter. If the patient has a atopy of five, now how much should the patient be able to produce negative pressure to come to minus one? How much negative pressure he has to generate? You tell me. See, the baseline is here. Baseline is here. Baseline is here. The the ventilator doesn't know. that we it doesn't have the information that auto peak is being generated now the baseline shifts here but it has to again touch this point to trigger a breath so how many centimeters of uh, negative pressure it has to generate can somebody type yes minus 6 cm perfect so minus 6 cm is it good or bad it is definitely not See that much he has to generate. He may not. He may not generate every time. See, he has generated here, but he has not generated here. So there are a lot of missed breaths. See, this is the reason why COPD patients go into dyssynchrony. Or to put it for your understanding, you can say this way that the yes, his diaphragm has contracted, but it has not contracted enough to stimulate or go to minus one. It has gone. to probably minus 1 but it was supposed to go to minus 6 isn't it and you should understand that work on a missed breath is more than a triggered breath so what you have to understand is on a ventilator somebody may be doing more work than what you would do otherwise not being on a ventilator that is what you have to understand so if somebody has a atopy it is wise to correct atopy medically and then also analyze how much is the atopy the only thing you can do here is you can reduce it to minus 0.5 other than that all the atopy that has to go is by altering the tidal volume or the ie ratio or medical therapy there is nothing other you can do with the trigger here so whenever you see atopy don't think you can correct every all atopy by altering your ventilator no it's always by bronchodilators only the only thing is by altering your ventilator you can reduce the atopy that is what you have to understand so this is the wasted breaths so this should not happen so if you put a trigger of minus 5 probably the patient should not be on a ventilator because i have said last time if somebody is able to trigger minus 6 cm probably in the first place it should not be on a ventilator in normal breathing we just trigger about 3 to 4 cm so i have said what is the trigger what is the uh, trigger that we have to set can somebody type flow trigger and pressure trigger what should be the trigger setting In a COPD, it could be point five, but if you keep very less, there will be kind of a uh, double triggering. So I would keep it around one to two, whether it is flow or pressure. And I have said there is no great difference in the present day ventilators. See, lot of. See the airway pressure has gone negative, gone negative. There is a, a, a patient wants to trigger a breath, but there are a lot of waste breaths. See, patient is on pressure support. So how would I alter? Here I would. How can you change the I ratio? Can somebody type here? How to reduce the wasted uh, breaths now? See, patient is on a which mode? Say decelerating. It is happening above the baseline, so it is pressure support ventilation. so how do you how do you alter the ie ratio and decrease the wasted breaths here can somebody type there is no button where you can go and change the ie ratio there is no button for ie ratio in uh, uh, pressure support ventilation what would you change decrease the tidal volume rate okay rate okay fine altering the flow which is called the rise time and you can increase the expiratory trigger sensitivity from 25% of x to 50% of x so that the ti is decreased see decrease the ti how do you decrease the ti you can decrease the ti by shifting your expiratory trigger sensitivity you go back and look at your uh, last session where i have given a uh, 
um, shot of the screenshot of the pressure support where there is a expiratory trigger sensitivity. You can decrease the trigger sensitivity, increase the trigger sensitivity from 25%. See, from 25%, if you shift to 50%, the uh, inspiration will get done here only. And for if you have shortened the inspiratory time, probably you'll require to you'll require to increase the rise time or increase the peak flows. Okay. So estimation is very easy. You once the set peak is reduced to zero and put an expiratory hold here, expiratory hold on a passive patient, you get the estimation of auto peak. And once the auto peep estimation come, they say, textbooks say that 80% of if the estimated auto peep should be a set peep. How a set peep count, counteracts a auto peep, it is difficult to understand. Mechanisms are not understand, understood. But I'll try to give some clarity in the COPD class. We'll just remember like this, for estimating the auto peep in a volume controlled ventilation, first thing is make the set peep zero. Then put an expiratory hold for two to three seconds or four seconds. The pressure starts rising. Pressure starts rising. This is the amount of auto peep. And for the estimated auto peep, we give 80% of the estimated auto peep as the set peep to contract that. So that triggering happens much faster. And the same thing, volume also can be done. If you give a long inspiratory hold, instead of 300 ml, the total tidal volume has come as 700 ml. And so what was the, uh, the amount of uh, volume that was trapped now? See, the apneic volume is 700, but he was only getting 300 all the time. But once we gave inspiratory, expiratory hold for about 4 to 5 seconds, another, another how much has come? 400 ml has come. This is the trapped volume. You can also estimate the volume, also estimate the pressure. So loops, see loops are not just another four or five slides. Loops are not very difficult to understand. What you have to understand is once you understand volume and pressure scalars, it is the combining of the two. See here, there is, see what we have combined here. This is combined here and this is combined here. So the two things that we combine here is what we get a loop. The information which we have already learned. For example, if this doesn't come to zero, starts ending here only, that means this has not come here to zero. That means that is a leak. That is what you have to understand. We have already learned that. You just have to understand what is the uh, what is the x-axis and y-axis and bring the same information here. It is very, very, very easy to understand. It will take little time, but you will get there. It's not difficult. So this is the inspiration and that is the expiration and it has to come back to the point of origin. If you have a peep, it will start from this point. If you have a peep of 10, then the curve will start from here to here. And there is volume here also below this, that is called the functional residual capacity. FRC is here. Always you have to remember that also. Because this is a pressure line, this will be the PIP pressure and this is the volume line. So what, what will be this? In volume scalar, what was the, on the volume line, what was this? This was the tidal volume. So this will be tidal volume now. See, if you are talking of a volume mode or a volume limited mode, that means this line is fixed. This line is fixed. So whenever the compliance changes, tidal volume will be generated 400 ml, but this will keep on going this direction. The pressure will keep on moving here. In a pressure mode, this will be set the volume line will be moving down. So you can understand modes also by looking at this. I have not put those slides because want of time. In the slides that I am going to send, I put that also, you can go through that. These are the infliction points. This is the zone of atelectasis, atelectotrauma. To avoid this, we put a peep. To avoid volume trauma, we always decrease the volume. So adding some amount of peep, Decreasing the tidal volume will always keep the lung in the open lung or lung protective zone ventilation. This is the principle. To remember this much, I will uh, expand this when, the, when I look into ARDS in the next week. Visually also, I have shown you this. 
I don't want lung to over inflate. I want somewhere the lung to be here and to move from here to here. I don't want the lung to become here and go here. So this is at electro trauma. This is volume trauma. I want the alveoli to be here all the time during inspiration and expiration. That's why I put a peep and I reduce the tidal volume. This is the visual appreciation of lung protective ventilation. See this we. Look at the plateau and tidal volume and drive-in pressures. Here we put a peep for everybody so that the alveoli is in the lung protective zone. This is called the bird beak appearance. Whenever you put a volume, suddenly for a lot of see the, the, the there is only a small increase in the volume. Look at the change in the pressure. That means there is over inflation of the baby lung. Little, little or no change in the VT, look at the pressure changes. Whenever you see this, you should reduce the tidal volume because it's overinflating the baby lung. This is very, very commonly we see. If you see something like this on a flow time or a PV loop showing like this, it is always a patient spontaneously breathing, coughing, something like this. This normally happens. <clears throat> so you either have to increase the peak flow sometimes or may have to give some sedation. Even this is a graph which shows that there is a <coughs> excuse me, improper flow. Flow is, pressurization is not very adequate. So probably if this patient is on a pressure support, it is not going smooth, it is going here or there is some small abrasions like this, iterations like this, probably we have to increase the peak flows or the raise time. And the flow of such time, it looks like this. <coughs> flow versus volume, it is again same flow and volume. We have plotted in the two directions. This is the inspiration, this is expiration, this is the peak inspiratory flow, this is the peak expiratory flow, this is the tidal volume. This will be sometimes, if you look at the uh, PFTs, they will be represented in the other direction, but most of our ventilators will display like this only. You have to remember that. So, what is the problem here? On which line there is a deficiency? On the which line there is a deficiency? This is flow versus time. This is inspiration. Then this is expiration. Expiration was supposed to go here. It has not gone here. It has gone here. So which is this line? Volume. Then what do we see in the volume versus time scalar? When the volume line doesn't touch the time baseline, what is the problem? Can somebody type? That's not air, air trapping. This is not flow. If this happened here, if this had come here, this is air trapping. This is the flow line. This is the volume line. That is a leak. Yes. If it is air trapping, it will come here. I'll show you the, that also in subsequent. In the volume, the deficiency is in the volume line. What is this? See, this is a deficiency in the flow. Uh, flow versus time. So this is the, then if you can look at what we already learned, this is what we learned. No? When it doesn't touch the baseline in the flow, it is always air trapping. So what I want you to understand is, once you learn the scalars, just look at what we have, where the deficiency is there in the loops. You don't have to relearn the loops. It's already there. The same thing is reflected just by practicing once or twice, you'll get it. This is a this is a prolonged, this is scooped up a pattern. We say the expiratory time is prolonged and it is taking more time. It's a scooped up. It's very typical of a increased airway resistance. And the third one is last slide is serrations, which I have already shown to you. Short tooth appearance is always in the expiratory limb. It's the expiratory limb we always we also saw on the flow such time, isn't it? This is flow. 
when the flow is coming there is secretions that is always secretions so remember that last two slides case see this is what we had uh, trouble about a month back patient posted for hg elderly lady um, no history of uh, any bronchospasm or copd immediately after intubation spo2 drops ventilation is not happening so how do you proceed first thing what do you see now i am not going to show unless you type or uh, unless uh, dr edwards closes the session i am not going to proceed from here you have to proceed i have told you ventilation is not happening but tube is in place we have seen the etco2 some etco2 is coming we have visualized the tube is in place so what on a ventilator why ventilation is not happening so what so why ventilation is not happening i want the post graduates to understand so what is what is what should have what what the laryngospasm is there agreed it is obvious so it's uh, even if it is bronchial ventilation ventilation will happen if there is no trigger there uh, why should be there any trigger it's a kind of patient is paralyzed isn't it it is obvious that patient has gone into spasm my point is why ventilator is not working what should you increase which there is something called what did i say there is one 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 safety mechanism in the ventilator whenever pressure goes up whenever pressure goes up whenever pressure goes up there is a safety valve what is that valve I told you many many times. You remember now. Now I have made you wait. You have to understand. Whenever patient goes into a spasm, the P max setting normally would be around thirty twenty five because we are ventilating a normal patient. If the P P I P goes to thirty forty forty five because the patient has gone into a spasm, because it is encountering more pressure going into the patient, it will start going out because the P max setting is at thirty. So first thing you have to do is increase the P max setting. Understood. i hope all of you will remember now that in a patient who goes into spasm ventilator has a defensive mechanism but you cannot set everybody at 60 and say that i am safe because when the patient really goes into a ards or patient will be pushing and ventilator will not give alarm so the p max normal setting should be around 25 for a anesthesia in a anesthesia setting even in a icu setting but when you when you, when ventilation doesn't start happening because of a spasm then you have to increase the p setting to 60 now i have increased ventilation is happening so how do i know whether the problem is airway or the problem is uh, uh, alveoli or the chest wall how do i know now ventilation is happening so i get a pip of around 55 i get a pip of 55 so what should i do now first step what should i do okay pip plat by look by how do you get uh, inspiratory over pip plat done i'm happy so now you get a thing like this with the stand box here okay so p plat is there somebody says bronco dilatation i'm very happy because that's the only way you can cut down the bronco spasm there is nothing much you can do on a ventilator but there are some things you can do on a ventilator so this is the graph you get see the difference between pa plateau is normal but see i said pip is 50 and plateau is 12 so look at the contribution of the airway so much of spasm is there now you know that uh, pip is not troubling it's not going and eating your alveoli isn't it so if the alveoli is being over stretched your p plat cannot be normal so how do you how do you manage can you see anything on a etco2 monitor and find out that the patient has spasm how does etco2 look in this situation can anybody type ah yes see here this was in the our own ot look at the sharp fin appearance of the etco2 here look at the Amount of bronco, so some air trapping is being shown in flow sustained scalar, 
and the patient has a sharp fin appearance. And look at the AVG, ETC O2 has gone up to 72. So we reduced the tidal volume, we increased the E time, how much E time was given? We kept on increasing the E time till the P plat become 23. Then my alveoli was getting overinflated. Then I, I said, okay, I don't want to increase the decrease my I time. So you can shorten the I time till the P plat becomes around 20, 22. That is the E time. Like we 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 had an IE ratio of almost like 1 is to 4, 1 is to 5 at times. And after two hours, our AVG was normalized. See, we didn't panic here. We knew what it was. What it was, this was a sharp pin that is obviously seen on the ETC O2. See, all the information is here. You don't have to stress yourself. You can peacefully handle such patients. Increase your P max, increase your uh, decrease your tile volume, higher ratio, short keep on shortening, look at your plateau pressure. Once the plateau comes around 20, 22, that is the amount required for I time. The rest goes to E time. Reduce your respiratory rate to around 12, 14, then you ventilate. After two hours, the carbon dioxide, everything was settled. Spasm, the medical management was done. Uh, spasm was gone. When we auscultated, we couldn't hear anything. We couldn't hear anything. There were no crepes, nothing, silent chest. After one hour, patient settled down. We went out with the surgery. We extubated the patient a uh, few hours post uh, operatively in the ICU. And patient went home comfortably. So what I want to underscore is, to make a decision whether there is an airway problem, lung problem, chest, wave, chest problem, there are parameters you have to understand and do what is required. One more, I think I had one more case, I think probably I missed somewhere. Okay, I'll just see. I had prepared one more case, I think I have put it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one more uh, patient, uh, the case scenario was something like this. Uh, patient had, oh, okay, it's here, it's here. We have another four or five minutes, sir? Yes, sir, you can proceed. Okay. So, patient posted for uh, lap hemicolectomy intubated. We measured the patient's height, volume controlled uh, on 40%, SpO2 was 96%. Uh, carbon dioxide was pumped into, what, what, should I, what should I have noted here? What should I have noted here? Can somebody type? What should I have noted before uh, uh, carbon dioxide was supposed to be pumped in? See, my PIP was say around uh, 16. I should have checked what? When my PIP is itself 16, my plateau pressure will obviously be less than that. So, plateau pressure and uh, with the inspiratory hold, I would have checked my Driving pressures. So these are my settings. Now carbon dioxide is pumped into the abdomen, reverse Strindenburg position done, SpO2 drops. My peak pressure now goes up to from 15-16 to 22. What do I do? How do I proceed? What is the problem? And my plateau goes up, goes up. Peak pressures also go up, my plateau also goes up. So is it a lung problem or a chest wall problem? Yes, it's a chest wall problem, isn't it? So we can broad, we can increase the lung protective parameters. I can uh, accept a plateau pressure of 20, 22 in this patient. I'm going to see this is how the this looks. The trans airway pressure is low, plateau has gone up, PIP has gone up. So now there are only two things: lung versus chest wall. Because of something that has clearly happened, I know it is because of this chest wall. So what should I do? So increase, so PEEP has been increased to 10 centimeters of water. Always, whenever you increase the pressure, look at your hemodynamics. Don't ever forget that because in a pressurized cavity, there is a bag with a lot of holes. If your lung starts expanding and compressing your heart, you may have the normal carbon dioxide, normal SpO2, but your lactates will start going up because you are not delivering the oxygen to the mitochondria at the cellular level. So, any intrathoracic pressure increase, always, always keep an eye on the hemodynamics. That is something that you have to 
accept a P plat of 25 recruitment maneuver, then you can be comfortable. You know that it's because of the chest wall, my alveolar has not gone bad. You know at the end of the surgery when the position is done all right and the carbon dioxide is sucked out, your patient is going to be all right. And you can do a recruitment before extubation and then keep the patient on a pressure support of 10 and peep of 10, ask him to have 4-5 or five breaths and extubate. Got it? So, thank you. I'll send the slides in our time or so. So, you can collect it from uh, sir. So, any questions, I'll be able thank to you, sir. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, sir. So, the interactive section, the answers given by the postgraduate shows that how much you, you are taken, your lectures are interestingly taken and how the PGs understood your lectures. I am very much happy that uh, PGs are interacting with your lecture. Thank you, sir. There are three questions posted. There is the first question is, what happened to pleural pressure measured by esophageal bulb in case of change in the chest wall and lung compliance? No, obviously, the pleural pressure will be very high so that you know. Uh, no, the pleural pressures will be normal so that the transpulmonary pressure will be normal uh, so that it differentiates when the when you put a esophageal balloon the when if the, the the problem is with the chest wall chest wall your pleural pressures don't change then you will know that you can be aggressive on your uh, implementation of your uh, peep and tidal wall but the problem with uh, putting a esophageal balloon is it, it, is, it is in a position. It doesn't show the whole lung transpulmonary pressure. So, we have not had good results. We had one study which showed that in ARDS, if you set PEEP according to uh, transpulmonary pressures with a plural balloon, the mortality and morbidity was less and the same study when replicated didn't come out well. The only reason because it is going to measure, if you put the balloon at the mid-zone, it will give only the transpulmonary pressure at the mid-zone. It doesn't give at the basis and above. So technically, it is not. Uh, it's very difficult to ascertain at the bedside. But given the situation, uh, the the esophageal pressures should be able to differentiate whether the contribution is by the lung or chest wall. But in anesthesia, I'm not very sure. I'll just uh, check up the literature and come back to you. I'll just uh, in the next session, I'll come back to you how. Uh, what alterations happen because not much studies have been done under anesthesia. I'll come back to you. I'm not very sure. Thank you, sir. Come back. Next question is how therapeutic peep correct auto peep? You said you will discuss. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to that on COPD, which is my next uh, talk. Sir, third question is what is time constant? Uh, we, we, time, time constant is the amount of time. See, if the lung is st uh, stiffer, it uh, it uh, it starts emptying faster. That means the amount of time required for the lung to fill up a certain volume is time constant. If, so, yeah. if, if somebody upon, takes, uh, yeah, if it depends upon, upon, upon how stiff the alveoli is not. Yeah. So, what you can understand is by looking at the pressure changes, you can estimate the time constant. I will, I will show you how to set the expiratory time looking at the expiratory time constants in COPD. I will, I will put in a slide of explaining. Let us not deviate. Uh, I, I feel that if you take home what is the lung protective parameters and the boundaries and the settings home to your, to your bedside and implement it in your OT, uh, I would be very, very happy having spent a few hours teaching you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. People are asking you for PPT presentations. I send it in another uh, 10 days because I was uh, I had some personal uh, commitment today. I had gone out. I came with I will send it in next one hour. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. At this uh, end of this session, I thank the Anastasia TV, A1 Logics, and also the sponsor, Akirla. Thank you. We will meet next week with ARDS. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, sir. Thank you.